สบายนะตงอกนี้โอ้ออกกำลังนะตงอกนี้สมองมวยบ้านนี่โอเคโอเคโอเค you need some energy so um, yes my name is Laura Mam I am um, Laura Mom actually and I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about original music how many of you like original music please raise your hands oh okay so a lot of you do And I want to tell you a little bit about it because I've had a very unique ex perspective about it. But before I do that, I kind of want to talk about why it's important. And I hope you guys really enjoy what I have to say. So, what are the two things that tourists know about Cambodia more than anything else? Can anybody tell me what they know? Khmer Rouge. Khmer Rouge what else do they know? This is the only thing people know about Cambodia. And it's a sad thing because, of course, it's wonderful what we have. We have beautiful temples, and we have this terrible history with the Khmer Rouge. But we have more than that. And the the, the thing that's sad about this to me is that this story is about loss, suffering, sadness, and devastation. There's nothing positive about this story. So I want to challenge. This story, and I want the reason I wanted to come on on TED today is because I want to challenge this story because I think that there's something much more positive that's happening. So I'm going to tell you the same story of Cambodia, but I'm going to tell it to you in a totally different light. Okay, so let's move to the next slide. Um, I is my mom here? Is she must be here? Hey, mommy, can we get a home boy and my mommy? <laughs> yeah, that's my mommy. All right. So I, I was born in America. I, my parents were both refugees. They went through the entire war. It was a terrible time for them, but they got to America and they decided they were going to thrive for me and my brother. So my mom didn't teach me Khmer. This is why I yay bai lam bai lam all the time. <laughs> but they didn't teach me Khmer because she was afraid I would have an accent when I was in America, and she wanted me to be American. She didn't want anybody to look at me and be like. Uh, not an American, so she didn't teach me. But the way that she kept me interested, and the way that she preserved identity of Cambodia for me, is by putting me in Khmer dancing, and teaching, having me go to some Khmer schooling. I learned about Ga Ka Ko Ko Ngo, all that good stuff, right? But she pulled me aside one day, and she said to me, "Laura, you're an American, but you cannot forget, complete, that your blood is Khmer, and this." One thing she said to me would kind of change my life forever, and it kind of marked the entire narrative of my entire life so far. So, what ended up happening? I don't know if any many of you know this, but I didn't plan to be a pop star in Cambodia. That was not my plan. I was planning to study dirt. I wanted to be an archaeologist. I wanted to be a, you know, digging up stuff, finding stuff. Find a pot and Uncle Wat, and that's all I wanted to do. Um, I had no plans, and so after college, I, I went to UC Berkeley. I studied anthropology with a focus on Cambodian history, and this really made me fall in love with Cambodia. This is where I found my passion for Cambodia, and afterwards, I ended up going and <laughs> basically joining an NGO called Global Heritage Fund, and I started working in preservation and conservation. But unfortunately, I got fired. And that sucked because in 2008 we suffered some economic devastation in America, and basically my boss said, "Laura, I'm sorry, I have to let you go because there's just no more money for you." But I feel so bad for you, and I like your YouTube videos. I'm going to give you a $3,000 check so you can go to Cambodia and do your music. And I was like, "Ah, oh, yeah, that's sweet. Okay, cool, whatever. I lost my job, but maybe I'll go to Cambodia and see what happens." Things went very well in Cambodia, and I got to become a part of this movement called the Original Music Movement. And I got to do all this fun stuff. I went on all these stages, and I went to all these different things, and it was really exciting. And the Original Music Movement swept me up into this magical music adventure that I've been on. And basically, afterwards, what I decided to do was start a production label called Bar Mai. How many of you know Queen Khmer? Some Ho Mui. Yeah, those my boys. That was me. <laughs> um, but I started a label, and I wanted to support other original artists because we were struggling. So I wanted to I I want to tell you that you know this movement is unique in Cambodia. No one else, no other country has an original music movement. Everybody just has normal music. Every time I say original music to a foreigner, they're like, "What do you mean original music?" 
It's just us. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that history so that you can understand it and you can appreciate your artists more. And I hope what you get out of this conversation that we have today is basically more love, more appreciation, and more excitement and hope when you think about the exciting times of Cambodia through the lens of original music. So when we started in Cambodia, before we even started, during the Khmer Rouge, they did not allow any music. How many of you know this? They did not allow any music that didn't support Anka, so no music that didn't support the communist regime. But when they left, this left this huge void, this huge void in Cambodia. And you guys were either babies at this time, or you were not yet around. So, but at this time, there was this massive void in Cambodia, and it was quite sad. So they had to fill it. So people like Rasmi Hang Mir and all these productions that you know and have known since you were a young person, they came in and they filled the void. What they did is they kept covering old songs as a form of preservation. And as a form of keeping up with the rest of society, they started copying songs. How many of you have listened to a copy song? Raise your hand. How many of you like to copy song? OK, hey, so a few, right? Let's be honest, it did entertain us. But what ended up happening as a result of this is that we ended up not making any new music whatsoever. And it turned out because we had such high levels of piracy in Cambodia, no copyright enforcement, it became impossible to make original music. So they didn't support it whatsoever. So that's what you get here. We got Sake Lo So, Take Me To Your Heart, Rip So These are all these songs that we know, but this is how we stayed, kept up with some of the modernity. For me, I didn't understand this when I was in the United States. I saw Mpote V, I saw these beautiful images of Sapiep, very sweet Khmer girls, but I, I didn't understand it because I was watching people like Lauren Hill and she was playing guitar and she was talking about her generation and she was saying, yeah, screw the man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak up for my people. And I loved it. So what ended up happening when I did come to Cambodia is this. I became the sweet chick, the nice Sapiep, nice girl, but I also wanted to be the edgy Lauren Hill, I'm going to speak my voice. And this is what got me to come to Cambodia, as I kind of got tired of saying to people, I, I tried to explain, why don't we have original music? I, I couldn't explain, I had no explanation. So I had to come myself and I decided to just go for it and find out what's going on. So I came and I said to people, hey, I want to do original music. I went to speak to a TV head and he said, Laura, nobody cares about original music. And I was like, really? Because I, I think a lot of people care about mu original music. And he's like, no, they just care if your face is pretty. And I was like, mm-hmm, okay. So that made me angry. So I was like, okay, forget it. I'm not going to even try on that side. I went to a production company and I said, ah, Laura, you're Svara Monkey. Cool, I like it. Let's do something together. And I said, okay. My condition is that we're going to do original music. And he said, look, I cannot support you. I cannot support you doing original music. You must copy songs because I can't sell a disc at more than $1.50. So I can't, I, can't get, I can't have you only doing one album a year. What would I make? I would make no money. I would close down tomorrow. So I said, mm, I don't want to be a part of this. So at that time, the word I kept hearing is, it's impossible. It's impossible to do Cambodia. Cambodian original music. But me and a few other artists, quite a few other artists, didn't believe that. So what happened next was Facebook. I love Facebook. How many of you use Facebook? How many people watch music off YouTube? Yeah, how many people love YouTube more than Facebook? Yeah, see, okay, yeah, that's cool. Um, but it was this incredible thing that happened when you guys were starting to grow up. So Facebook and YouTube came, and suddenly you didn't have to go to a TV station, or you didn't have to go to a production and get put out in a VCD or a DVD. You didn't have to do that anymore. You could just get yourself up on the internet, and you could connect with any fan in Batambong or Siem Reap or Kapungspu. You could connect, and this changed everything. This brought out some of the artists that you know and you love. So this is where we found people like Ada and Hang Pitu, and we had Clap Your Hands doing hip hop. Do you guys remember these guys? How many of you love it? Ho Mo if you love these guys? Yeah, see? 
And I, I want to make a special note. How many of you know Miss Sopian? Raise your hand. Yeah? How many of you love her some homoy? Okay. Miss Sopia did something really revolutionary, and she, nobody, no newspaper or anybody has done anything to say that what she did was cool. She was in the system, she was a karaoke star, she was doing what she was told, and at this time, she said, no, I'm gonna do original music. So she came out with All Lies, first original album. From what I heard, the company was upset, they didn't want to support it, they didn't want, want to do it, but she fought for it. So the next time you see Miss Sopia, you better love her a little bit more, because she fought for original music. She fought for her right to do it, and she said, I'm gonna do it. So these revolutionary guys came out and did some really, really cool stuff, and it even gave me, a, an American Cambodian, a chance to come here and connect with all of you guys. But it wasn't enough, we were still struggling. No one was calling us for concerts or anything like that. We weren't making no money, we were very poor, it was very sad, so what had to happen next? Sponsors. Love sponsors. Give it up for sponsors. A bunch of sponsors came out and started to support us. And they started to say, hey, you know what? My brand is international. I'm Pepsi. I can't take a copied song to Pepsi regional headquarters. And if it's copied, I, I can't play that. That's not legal. We, we follow international standards. So all of a sudden, I was like, oh, so you mean you can support us, right? And he's like, mm-hmm, yeah, let's start doing that. I was like, yeah, we're going to go. So. It was really exciting. These guys came out and started supporting it. And a lot of artists started getting different things. It kind of ripped open the whole thing. What it signaled to Cambodia was that you don't have to join a production anymore. You can do it yourself. You can go out there and talk to a sponsor by yourself, build yourself a PowerPoint presentation, and be like, look it, I'm awesome. Give me money. So, <laughs> so that happened. But something really major happened, and that was smart music. So I want you guys to understand why smart music, this is not a promotion for smart music, but I want you to understand why it's important. Smart music came out and started to say publicly and said, hey, if you're an original music artist, I'm gonna give you money. I'm gonna give you money to make your music. Nobody ever gave us money. Nobody ever, ever did it. If we did something for anyone else, we had to do a commercial, we had to do a jingle or whatever. Here was a company that said, I'm gonna fund your music, just put it up on a streaming platform. What did this do? This totally ripped open a hole in the whole entire market. And this is why you guys all think original music is cool. Because what happened was organic. It started from the ground and it came up. All these artists came out of nowhere and now you know how many artists? So many artists because they had a chance. They had a chance to make some cash, to fund their music and actually go out and do some concerts. So it was really exciting when this all happened. What Smart did also is bring Jesse J and Demi Lovato. Do you guys remember Jesse J and Demi Lovato? How many of you went? It was fun, right? And who got to open the stage for Jesse J and Demi Lovato? That was me. It was great. <laughs> but it was not just me. It was quite a few more people. And we got a chance to show Cambodia and also get permission from an international artist, which is very hard to do, to open the stage for them. You need to get permission all the way to Hollywood to get that. And we did that with them, and it changed everything for us because it was a national symbol saying, hey, we're getting started. So our movement was starting to get up there. We were getting sponsors, we were starting to go for it. And then the public sector and our government started to support us too. They put us alongside Aux Kunkanya and Prisovat, our legends, at the National Games opening. And that basically was a symbol. I believe it served as a symbol to say to Cambodia, yep, we have our old legends, and we have our new people. And they're both acceptable. And that's wonderful. So the public sector said, actually the ministry came out and said, you know, we should have our own original music. It's important. We can't just copy foreigners. We need our own identity. It's important. So that gave us a big, fat push. And finally, what happened next is we went on the first all provincial, it was a provincial tour all original music. I'm not sure if you guys realize how important this was. Before this, you could not get on, an in, on a provincial stage if you weren't like a sexy girl doing something for beer and doing karaoke. It was a monopoly. We were not allowed in, we were not getting called. But Smart decided to take us to the provinces. And now let me tell you the backstory. Every marketing agency in Cambodia said, no one is going to come watch a bunch of YouTube kids. They're not that good. They're whatever. Why are you putting money? Why are you wasting money? You should just put it over here. And that was what we were up against. So there was a lot of disbelief leading up to this. I know you guys got to see the outside. It's just like, yay, a concert. No, there was a lot of fighting. 
a lot of fighting that went to make this happen. And what happened when we went to the provinces? We kicked ass. <laughs> That's what happened. People came out and they sang our lyrics. They screamed for us. I don't know if any of you have been to a provincial concert before, but for the most part what happens is you go, oh boy. <sighs> That's usually what happens. But at these concerts, you would have thought it was a music festival in the United States. You would have thought it was Coachella. They were screaming. It was so intense. The screaming and the support was so good that Rolin, who everybody knows, right? Everybody knows Rolin? Turned to me and Kupong Spoon said, Laura, Bong Posabala. <laughs> she said, I'm Goosebanta. I have never seen Kupong Spoo. I've never heard Kupong Spoo like this. This is crazy. This is awesome. This is amazing. So this is kind of what happened. This solidified our movement. People in the provinces, people in the city, sponsors and public got to see what we were doing. And that was because of you guys because you guys decided to support us. So what I want to ask you before I go on with this presentation is to give yourself a round of applause for doing that. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so now I'm going to take a little bit of a closer look about what's going to happen, what's gonna, what is happening now in the music, and what is going to happen. So the most common question I get is, why are Cambodian people so obsessed with love songs? Does anybody know why we're so obsessed with love songs? Anybody have an idea? Yes, please. We are loving people. Yes, we are very loving people. I think that's absolutely true. And I want to add to that because it's kind of a, I think it's a bit of a funny story. So let's take a look at this really quickly. Um, so the Khmer population. In 1975, before the war started, basically we were at... 7.5 million Cambodians. After the war, we lost about 2.3 million people. Artists, intellectuals, everybody, all the talent. We lost them all. And we don't even know what the real number of how many people died actually is. We don't know that yet. Went down to five, five to six million in about 19, 1980. But from 1980 until now, the population has gone from five to six million to 16 million. My mom says, in the words of my mom, she says, the Cambodians have been very busy. <laughs> busy with love and busy with babies, right? That's all we've been doing all day long. We've just been making babies all day long. <laughs> so is it any wonder that the most common subject we talk about is love? It's the most pressing thing. We are very busy with this action, and we need to deal with it, OK? But I think there's something really interesting that I want to show you that's a, that gives me hope and that gets me excited about what's going to happen in your generation. So this is what we call a baby boomer generation. After a war, people come back and they're like, OK, our priorities are to be safe and to make babies and to repopulate our, our nation. So we have a baby boomer generation. So I want to take a little quick look at a comparative situation to give you a sense of what might happen in Cambodia going forward. So in the United States, in 1945, World War II ended. People came back, and a baby boomer generation started. In 1960, which is one of the most famous international music periods in the world, we had artists like the Beatles, Jimi Hendrix, uh, David Bowie, Bob Dylan, Nina Simone. These people changed everything by getting Cambodians to think about, ah, not Cambodians, I'm sorry, Cambodians too, but they got Americans to think about their identity. They promoted peace, love, unity. They were fighting against a really rigid conservative society, and they got everybody to start thinking even bigger. That's what they did. At this time, from 1960 to 1970, it was a baby boomer generation, and the average GDP rate of growth was 7.5%, fluctuating in between. So let's take a look back at Cambodia. Cambodia right now is in a baby boomer period. Our average GDP for 10 years, for a decade, has been 7.5, just like the United States. And we have an original music movement that is starting to speak about things beyond what we talk about every single day. So it's my belief, these numbers, it's these things that have me believing that Cambodia is on the verge of another golden music period. Homoy, if you agree. Thank you. So, to conclude this, I want to say that 
you know, I really believe in your guys' generation. I, I'm going to continue to stay here. I'm going to continue to work with Cambodian music, original music industry. And I hope that you guys now, that after you've seen this, you kind of understand how much people have struggled to make this happen and how wonderful it is. And that every time you now listen to songs on Facebook, YouTube, smart music, whatever, whatever you use to listen to the music, every time you click like, every time you comment, it is one more step into the future. So I want to leave you with one lyric that is from one of my favorite songs. Um, and I think it's an amazing piece of lyric um, that's not about love, and it's about the reality that your generation is facing. And I think that, I don't know, when I listened to this, this lyric, it completely just blew me away, and I felt inspired for the rest. I feel inspired to keep working here for another decade or two. So um, this song is by Kumain Kamai. It's called Gombram. How many of you guys know, have you guys heard Kamaram? Some people have, okay, cool. So it's a beautiful lyric written by Pan Lu, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to translate it in English um, for the sake of the video. But um, it's beautiful. I love what he wrote. And he said, far from my family, I miss them. I just want to see my father and my mother happy. Meeting and parting is always short. Your child here can only say goodbye for now. Please don't cry, my good-natured parents. I've almost reached my goals. Your child cannot turn back now. My destiny is about to answer me. My dreams are finally close. And I believe that this is the story of you guys. And I am so very inspired by all of you. And I hope you continue to support original music. And you realize that this is the same story that involves the Khmer Rouge and involves the temples and all that stuff. But this time, we're coming back and we're gonna do something awesome and it won't be a sad story. So thank you guys for listening.